Hey everybody, this is Steve, and the church isn't meant to be kept a secret. I recently heard someone call the Orthodox Church the best kept secret in America. Maybe you've heard that before too. People know what Catholicism and Protestantism are, but Orthodox Christianity? That's not even on the radar of a lot of people. In fact, when my buddy Christian told his dad that he was becoming Orthodox, his dad asked, you're Jewish now? We Orthodox Christians make up less than 1% of the American population, so we shouldn't be surprised that no one's heard of us. But that's beginning to change. It's crazy to think, but a lot of people have first heard about the church because of videos like this. A lot of people experience the church as a secret that they've somehow stumbled upon, sometimes completely by accident. And some people will see this as a point of pride. You'll even hear some Orthodox Christians confidently say that we don't proselytize, that we don't evangelize. That perspective seems a little bit problematic. As we covered back in episode 142, Orthodox Christians have a 2,000-year-old connection to the Apostles, an unbroken line stretching back to those first believers to whom Christ entrusted the Church. But if we claim that we don't evangelize, then we're forgetting that when Jesus entrusted those Apostles with the Church, He commanded them to evangelize. One of the last things Jesus told His disciples before He ascended into Heaven was, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age." So we can't claim to hold fast to the faith Jesus gave to the apostles if we forget this important command. If we say that we don't evangelize, then we might as well say that we're not really Christians because it's breaking from the tradition we receive from the apostles. In fact, this special connection we have to the apostles, the presence of Christ through the Holy Spirit, is tied to evangelism. Remember those verses from the Gospel according to Matthew? The Lord's promise to be with us is tied to us preaching and making new disciples. And that's not the only time the Lord says this, because in the book of Acts, Jesus tells the apostles, You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth." Again, there's a close connection between being the Lord's witnesses and being close to the Lord. The two cannot be separated. But okay, if we're called to preach the gospel, then what does this actually mean? What are we actually called to do on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, for Orthodox Christians, evangelism isn't a program or strategy. It's not a marketing campaign. We preach the gospel because, in a sense, we can't help it. Here's a good way to think about it. Have you ever had a crush on someone? Like a really strong crush, which you're so excited about that people get tired of hearing you talk about how wonderful that special someone is. But you can't stop yourself because you're just so crazy about them and all you can think about is how much you want to be with that person. Similarly, if we love the Lord, of course we're going to talk about Him and want to introduce others to Him because of how great He is. If we love the Lord, of course He's going to be a visible part of our lives. And he's going to be visible in a way that attracts others to him. Because more than anything we say, our greatest witness in the world is what we do and who we are. We get a lot of messages from people who've watched our videos and tell us how excited they are to discover that the Orthodox Church really is the one true church. But we also get messages from people who, after all that excitement, were super disappointed after actually visiting an Orthodox community near them. One person even complained that the church seemed right on paper, but not in practice. Yikes. That's on us. All of us, even if our local parish doesn't fall short in this way. Because we're not a bunch of individual, unconnected Christian communities. We are, together, Christ's one true and undivided church. And as Christ's church, we have to make sure that we are all living up to what he has called his church to do. To what he has called his church to be. We can't depend on simply having the right beliefs or right theology. We can't depend on simply being right on paper. We can't depend on people to be drawn to the church because of the witness of saints that lived hundreds of years ago. Remember last week's video, we are all called to be saints and to bear witness to Christ by living lives that are worth imitating. We need to live lives that cause people to look at us and say, I want that. We need to be a living witness to the Lord, and we need to make an active effort 
to spread the gospel. The good news is that none of this is very complicated. In fact, there are just two things we need to keep in mind in order to be the evangelical church that Christ calls us to be. Two keys to being the church that preaches the gospel to all nations. First, evangelism is beautiful, not ugly. When people hear the word evangelism, it puts a bad taste in their mouth. People seem to think that it means telling others that we're right and they're wrong. That evangelism is aggressive and judgmental and pretty off-putting. And that makes sense, because some of the most common images of evangelism that we see here in America are of people holding up signs about sin and death and preachers yelling at non-believers about having to believe in Christ to avoid eternal hellfire. Those images are not attractive, they're scary, unloving, and just plain ugly. That way of talking pushes people away because no one is attracted to that kind of negativity and ugliness. But thankfully, that's not what true evangelism looks like. Because the whole point of evangelism is to attract people to the church, and people are attracted to beauty. But when I say beauty, I don't mean pretty. I don't mean something that just looks good in a superficial sense. I mean something that reflects and radiates pure goodness and truth. And that doesn't mean simply telling people what is good, what is right and wrong. It means showing them the goodest and truest thing of all, God himself. And what is a more beautiful image of God than the crucifixion and resurrection? What is more beautiful than the story of the all-powerful creator of the universe becoming a human being, suffering on the cross in solidarity with dying humanity and defeating death so that all of humanity could have eternal life. And what is more beautiful than not just hearing about it, but actually participating in that death and resurrection? I don't think there's anything that can top that. And St. Paul, who was probably the greatest evangelist of the early apostles, agreed. When he visited Athens and saw the people there worshiping statues of the Greek gods, he didn't yell that they were all going to hell for not believing in Jesus. Instead, St. Paul noticed that in addition to their many statues, the Athenians had an altar dedicated to an unknown god. Rather than criticizing what the Athenians got wrong, St. Paul focused on what they got right. The one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. St. Paul showed them that this unknown god was more beautiful than Zeus and Athena and all the other gods they worshipped. He showed them this by bearing witness to Christ and his resurrection. And he did so not only with his words, but with his actions. Because St. Paul sacrificed his life for Christ. He endured beatings and persecutions. He fasted and prayed constantly. He was repeatedly thrown in jail. And despite the constant risk of death, he never denied Christ when things got tough. Now, maybe we're not all called to be evangelists in the same way that St. Paul was, but that doesn't mean we can't show people the beauty of God's kingdom. We can radiate the beauty of Christ's unconditional love and sacrifice by making it a part of our day-to-day -day lives, by joyfully being kind to people that are mean to us, by willingly forgiving the debts of people who may owe us money or a favor, by risking social rejection, by befriending someone that everyone else thinks is weird. When we do these things in a cheerful way, we are evangelizing because we are showing others that there is something good in being a follower of Christ, something different than the destructive patterns of this world. That there's life in the church, that there's something real and powerful about what we believe in because it makes a difference in how we treat others. It's not just something that looks good on paper. And the people who see this in our lives will want to learn more about what that real and powerful thing is. They're going to look at us and say, I want what they have. And that brings us to the second key point about evangelism. Evangelism is personal. This means that we need to present the gospel, not in an abstract way, but in a manner best suited to the person or people receiving it. The story of St. Paul and the ancient Greeks demonstrates this perfectly. St. Paul saw the cultural and spiritual state of the Athenians, and he presented the gospel to them in a way they could understand. Maybe this sort of preaching wouldn't have connected with other ancient civilizations, like the Persians or the Egyptians, or even other Greek city-states, like the Spartans. But that didn't matter because St. Paul was in Athens. He was preaching to the Athenians, so he delivered his message in a way that Athenians 
would understand. But don't just take it from me. In his first epistle to the Corinthians, St. Paul tells us that this is how he evangelized to people. He wrote, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To the weak, I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. This is why, in the Orthodox Church, we try to bring the gospel to people on their own turf. We don't sacrifice the truth, but we do share it in a way that other people can comprehend and grasp. I mean, there's a reason we're on YouTube, right? This personal approach to evangelism is how the Church first found its way to America. In 1793, St. Herman led a group of Orthodox monks from Russia to Alaska. When he arrived, he met the native people, called the Aleuts, and he got to know them and their way of life. After a little while, St. Herman and his team were able to translate the gospel and divine services into the Aleuts language. By the end of St. Herman's first year in Alaska, over 7,000 Aleuts had been baptized. St. Herman's mission was nothing new for the Orthodox Church. Almost a thousand years earlier, Saints Cyril and Methodius created an alphabet for the Slavs so that they could read and understand the gospel in their own language. And 700 years before St. Cyril and Methodius, the Holy Spirit came down upon the apostles on the day of Pentecost and gave them the ability to share the gospel to all the people gathered there from all over the world. And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? We hear them speaking in our own tongues, the wonderful works of God. Now, here's where things get a little tricky. Today, it's mostly Protestants that translate the gospel into different languages. We Orthodox Christians, especially in America, tend to argue that we should keep doing services and reading scripture in our native languages, even though we're in another country and these aren't really our native languages anymore. But if we look at the history of the church, if we look at the example of the saints, if we look at the teachings of Christ and the Holy Scriptures, that's not how evangelism works. That's not what Christianity is all about. And I think we realize that because the good news is that little by little, as the church gets its feet under it here in the United States, this is changing. I mean, even something like Be the Bee would have been unimaginable not too long ago. And some Orthodox Christians have even begun translating the services into not just English, but Spanish and other languages to reach more of the people that live here in the United States. Because as grateful as we are to the history and cultures and languages that have brought us to this point, we have to be careful. We can't make it seem like you have to be a part of a particular culture or speak a particular language to be a member of the church. That's not a personal way to share the gospel with people. But this isn't new. This question has popped up many times in church history, right from the beginning, in fact. In Acts 15, we read about how some people thought that the first Gentile converts needed to first be circumcised, that they needed to first become Jewish in order to become Christian. This is something St. Paul writes about in his epistles, where he opposes the idea that the church is somehow limited to a particular group of people. He reminds us that the church is a reality that transcends language and culture, saying, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Obviously, St. Paul knew that some people were still Greeks and some were still Jews, that people were still male or female. It's not that our differences disappear, but rather that our differences are no longer a barrier to union with God or to union with one another. You don't have to be a Jewish man to follow Christ, just like you don't have to be Greek, Russian, Arab, or anything else to follow Christ. Christians are not united by a specific language or culture. We are united in God the Father by our faith in Jesus Christ through the grace of the Holy Spirit. And the highest point of that unity here on earth is the divine liturgy. No matter what language we serve it in, it's still the same liturgy. It's still the same heavenly reality that unites us when we come together in unity of faith. And it's our job to invite others into this unity as well. So invite someone to church to experience the liturgy, even if they've never been before. Don't be afraid to read the scripture with a friend and reflect on how God is active in your life. You could even send someone this video because you never know what kind of conversation it can start. And above all, whatever you do, do it with love 
and sacrifice. Because we are the disciples of Jesus Christ, and Jesus told his disciples to evangelize, to spread the good news to the ends of the earth. Even if you're simply sharing that message in your home or neighborhood, Remember the two keys to evangelism we cover today. Remember first to show others the beauty of our life in Christ, and second to do so in a way that's personal. These are simple things that Christians have been doing from the beginning, inviting everyone to experience the joy of God's kingdom. So let's be the bee and radiate the beauty of the church in a way that the whole world can see. Be the bee and live orthodoxy. Remember to like and subscribe and share. I'll see you all next week. It's getting chilly out there. Below the video, you'll find links for Be the Bee hoodies, t-shirts, and more. And of course, on your screen, you'll be able to click to subscribe and check out more great videos from us at Y2AM. Thanks for watching. God bless you.